it is. The precise language of the engineer, it's called the jet propulsion gas turbine. To you and me, it's the jet engine, one of the marvels of this century of marvels. When they start it up, stand back. Its deep-throated voice will climb to the shrieking of a thousand fiends. Its flaming breath is white-hot gas, fed by drafts of liquid fuel. Watch that gallon go. And all around, the straining fury of its power sets the very air a shudder. Here is the inside story. Air and fuel ignited in combustion chambers, and the resulting gas ejected through a jet pipe at the rear. Now, in the path of the rushing gas, insert a bladed wheel, a turbine. Link the turbine to a powerful fan, so placed as to ram the air into the combustion chambers under pressure. Let the gas dry the turbine and the fan. Under fierce compression, the temperature rises, and the expanding gas roars from the jet pipe with tremendous force. This is the turbine jet, the power that is driving the fighters of today through the sonic barrier. Now, on the forward end of the shafting system, mount an air screw. Here is another new means of propulsion, the turbine propeller, the engine that is opening fresh vistas of simplicity, efficiency, speed. <laughs> to the British aircraft industry, the turbine jet and the turbine propeller engines have brought a golden opportunity. Says the Dean of British Air Designers, Charles Clement Walker, in this new form of air travel, Britain has the chance to make up the leeway lost in the war. When we were developing combat aircraft to the exclusion of all else. In many a research center, they are grappling with the special problems posed by the enormous power of the jet. And as Britain's new prototypes take shape, planes which many believe will give her a leading edge in the competition of the sky, a glimpse of the future they are heralding is given by the well-known airline executive, Peter Macefield. At a speed of 2,000 miles an hour, which is at least in sight, the journey from London to New York could be completed non-stop in about two hours. And because New York time is five hours back on London time, passengers could leave London after lunch, say at two o'clock in the afternoon, and arrive in New York for an 11 o'clock coach the same morning. So as far as the clock goes, they would arrive three hours before they started. No wonder that amid such promise of adventure, the rising generation should desert all loyalties to the footplate and the fire brigade should crane its neck skyward to the streaking silver that bespeaks tomorrow. Pleasure to meet you. Look, and I ain't only 52. That's all I won. Boy, he's flying by. Gosh, what? It's upside down. A Hawker N746. That's a vampire. No wonder, too, that the eerie whistle of the jet should have brought a mysterious jargon, all its own, to the language of the engineer. Well, with the tubular type heat exchanger, to get the air, you want a lot of tubes, and consequently, the inside diameter of the tubes are very small. Consequently, the overall power output will go down, just like this. began in the year 1926. Remember 1926, when the symbol of Great Britain was a famous bowler hat, when America stood silent at Valentino's grave, when Suzanne Longlong was queen of the center court at Wimbledon, when Donahue was booting home the winners. 
In that year, at the Royal Air Force College at Cranwell, there was a young cadet who had been interested in aircraft since the tender age of three. His name, Frank Whittle. Now in his 19th year, Cadet Whittle wrote a thesis. His idea was not new. 2,000 years ago, Hero of Alexandria had thought of it. Later in the pages of history, Newton had given it his passing attention. But Whittle believed that this idea could fly. It was fortunate indeed that Whittle's notions should gain the sympathetic ear of his instructor, Flight Lieutenant Patrick Johnson. Doubly fortunate that Johnson happened to be well acquainted with the world of patents. That's right. Well, come and tell me about it. I haven't got time now. Yes, oh, certainly. Fine. Uh, look. <clears throat> this represents a centrifugal type compressor, like an enlarged supercharger. I use this to pull in air at the front and to compress it into combustion chambers, like this, where the injection and burning of fuel heats and expands the air and gives it enough energy to drive a turbine, which drives the compressor, after which the air still has enough energy to give a high-velocity propelling jet. Have you ever patented anything? No, I don't know a thing about it. Does a patent both publish and protect? That is the whole point of patents. But one thing's essential. File a patent application before touting the thing round. Otherwise, you haven't a hope. I'll tell you what, let's rough out a specification now. Well, what? Fine, what do we do? Well, you make a rather better sketch, and I'll get on with the clever bit, the writing. OK. And so, with the specifications of an idea tucked under his arm, Johnson walked through London's stately Inns of Court to the patent office. On his way, he glanced into the library, that famous library where the walls are lined with dreams, illustrious, unknown, crazy. Would this dream fade, forgotten too? Or might it usher in a revolution in technology? In the county of Leicestershire stands the town of Lutterworth. Here John Wycliffe was born. From here Thomas Cook organized his first tour. And here too, in a disused foundry, a little company set out to bring the idea of the jet to roaring life. Here, Whittle and his associates started up the age of the gas turbine, and in so doing, embarked on the inventor's long road of discouragement and danger. England heard little of all this, but what it heard convinced it that this idea could only fly in the face of all experience. Have you heard the latest crazy idea about aero engines? Some Air Force chap, Whittle I think his name is, or something like that. Yes, something about using gas, 500 or 600 degrees temperature. Nothing could take a temperature like that. Why, the whole thing would explode in his face. But across the fields of Leicestershire, 
Where Squire Osbalston once ran his 30 miles a day, and Nimrod talked horses all night as the port went round, a new music began to mingle with the sound of hoof and horn, the whining cry of a gas turbine running sweet and true. But as yet, only for a moment, time and time again, they saw the instant of success dissolve once more into weary hours of failure. I'm sorry to say we've had another blade failure. We were running at nearly full speed and one of the blades came off. If we could only get another 50 degrees centigrade, it will do the trick. Yes, please do. I'm sure we're almost there. They were almost there. And in the final months of World War II, the idea was not only aloft, but on active service. And as the British meteors tore into the flying bombs, Jet met Jet in combat. In a few short years, the gas turbine has burnt its fiery mark into the calculations of engineers and economists alike. Yesterday a hope in the minds of a dogged few. Today manpower and money on a national scale are flowing into its development. For in this latest wonder of applied science, Britain sees a source of her future wealth and welfare. To the birthplace of the jet are coming students from all the world to take their first peep at this child of Britain's brains. But most vital to a people whose memorials of the poignant past daily remind them of the stark needs of the present is the fact that this invention places in their hands an export attractive to nearly every progressive country overseas. In the factories whose devoted labor sustained the fighter pilots through the days of peril, skills famous the world over are now working to capacity on foreign orders for a new prime mover, at once cheap, efficient, simple. And in the heart of London, the company which pioneered the jet now adds to Britain's earnings of foreign currency by the sale of licenses abroad to grant your company a license under these patents and an option under the other 300 or so which apply to gas turbines in general mm -hmm. on the terms I gave you yesterday. Meanwhile, screaming from the rooftops to the stratosphere, the jet is opening realms of height and speed hitherto unknown to British test pilots like John Cunningham and John Derry. The greatest height we've been to so far has been 59,446 feet. That is nearly 12 miles high and about double the height of Everest. We have achieved, uh, um, exceeded the speed of sound in the DH-108 in which we've done most of the work. And uh, contrary to opinion, this has no physical effect on the human body. History, they say, is but a series of exploded ideas. Each day, each hour, the jet propulsion gas turbine is making history before our eyes, piling record upon record, breaking record, shattering the accepted ideas and limits of the piston engine age. Today, British engineers are foretelling as great a future for this marvel on the ground as in the air. In workshops which were known to Watt and Stevenson, they are now forging a second industrial revolution based on the gas turbine. Soon, a cracked British Railways Express will be gas turbine hauled, says Chief Engineer Hawksworth of the Western Region. Two locomotives uh, powered by gas turbines are at present under construction for the western region of the British Railways. 
We hope to use them to haul the famous Cornish Riviera Express, and we believe they will be capable of very high average speeds. From other furnaces are coming the special secret formula metals to start the new power source on its career at sea. Soon, one of Britain's largest tankers will be equipped with a marine gas turbine engine designed to give maximum performance on the cheapest of fuels. I've just had a communication from the company in which they say that our gas turbine is nearly ready. We're all ready to accommodate it and test it out under seagoing conditions. But Captain McDougall will not be the first skipper to sail under gas, for already under trial is the first gas turbine warship, His Majesty's experimental gunboat number 2009. By land and sea and air, the story is the same. From Britain's laboratories and factories and airfields, the whistle of the jet is spreading all around the globe. A contribution of dimensions yet unfathomed to mankind's mastery of space and speed and power. Of 1926, his Air Commodore Sir Frank Whittle, KBE CB FRS. Today, the little company in the disused foundry has given birth to another mighty field of industrial endeavor. And now, behind the lonely pioneers of an idea, there stands the science of two continents. A century ago, the jet propulsion gas turbine did not exist. In a quarter century, it has given us a vision of the sounds and shapes of future time. What wonders will the jet have wrought? A quarter century from now, 